Is this working? Yep. So I just wanted to start with a few words. Basically, like when I was a kid, I used to think how in order to um, to be a sort of progressive power in the world, you have to break the law once in a while in terms of like going against the rules and norms imposed by the uh, social um, trends of the current times. And now when I'm slightly older, I still basically think the same, like we should sort of respect our tradition, but every once in a while, um, listen to that adventurous spirit in ourselves and then uh, follow routes that have never been taken before and go against uh, trends and uh, basically paradigmatic ideas of the actual times. So our today's speaker, Dr. Stanley Aronovitz, he's one of those uh, minds, I would say, that has ever since swum against the mainstream uh, of the, that sort of paradigmatic thinking in philosophy and science. And um, so he's like a really good candidate for us to deliver another one of those like awakening punches for our postdoc community and like direct our, you know, remind us where the secret of real creativity is um, and direct it in the right direction or maybe the left direction, you would say. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. So anyway, he's a professor of sociology and uh, urban education, as far as I know, at City University of New York. And um, he's been a political activist for uh, many decades. He's the, the editor of, uh, some people would say famous, some other people would say infamous journal Social Text. And um, he also published or edited 25 books. Uh, the last one is named Against Schooling. Mm -hmm. in which, in quite an exciting way, he talks about the major demerits of the modern American education. And um, uh, finally, in 2002, he was the Green Party candidate for the governor of New York State. So I told just a few I suppose I have to use the microphone. Do I have to use the microphone? You can use this one. And you can use I can, I, be, because well, it's, I it's, um, it's a little forbidding. To be, in, be, to be behind a lectern when you have relatively few people. So with your permission, is that okay? That's all right, fine. Uh, it's much easier for me not to use it, although I might lean on it uh, occasionally. Um, I would like t today to focus on two very um, different things which I think at the end I will try to put together. The first is the problem of science policy, that is the relationship between science and politics in the most direct sense, with the refer specific reference to the United States. Um, there are two elements of policy. Uh, one is um, the private pharmaceutical, in biology, the pharma f private pharmaceutical companies food processing companies and, and other corpor private corporations. And the second is the United States government. The second issue I want to talk about is a little bit more, if not controversial, maybe it is controversial, a little bit about the politics of science itself. I have written a book on the subject, actually, about the internal politics of science, which is called Science is Power. Um, which was published in 1988 and has now been just re reissued by the University of Minnesota Press. And I suspect the reason that they reissued it is because people are reading it again for whatever reason. Um, a week ago, that is on the 9th of March, the newly elected president of the United States, Barack Obama, did something that has not literally been done uh, by an American president since John F. Kennedy in the early 1960s, which is to actually make a speech in which he enunciated the broad outlines of a science policy. One of his, uh, two of his predecessors, George, the two George Bushes, George Herbert Walker Bush and his son, George Walker Bush, never bothered to articulate a science policy. 
In fact, they did not articulate anything else but a war policy. Uh, but Kennedy and Obama and in between Bill Clinton did in fact articulate policies. And Obama's was even more stunning than the other two because what he said is he wanted to restore science to a place where scientists and not the government directed and led scientific research, which was a very interesting idea. And he made a very specific statement, and that statement was that he wanted science to drive policy and not policy to drive which means, he didn't say what it means, but what he implied was that scientists would have the freedom to perform their work according to the precepts of science itself exclusively rather than doing what has been done pretty openly <coughs> although covertly before that, since, well, in the first place since the early 1980s, which I'll get to in a minute, and covertly since the rearmament program of the United States in, 19, in 1938. What was, what was true of the period from 1938 and the Obama speech is that with exceptions, and I want to stipulate this, I want to be very clear, there are always exceptions. It's a very big country. There are people who do what is sometimes described as pure science, science which is undirected by, by, by application, science which is undirected by contract, science which is self-generated. Most of those people in physics are theoretical. Uh, physicists, probably true in chemistry and biology. Evolutionary biology, which gets very little money, is free to think uh, thoughts of its own in many respects because it doesn't have that kind of connection. But for the bulk of the scientific community, what drives research in the United States, and I suspect this is true virtually everywhere, is government and corporate policy. The priorities are not those which are self-generated, except insofar as theory doesn't form applied research, but are generated by the priorities of the nation and of business. The reason I mentioned 1938 is because it was then that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt appointed the first science advisor to his administration uh, in the history of the United States. Science advisor was asked to decide a major issue, which was in the process of rearmament, that is the process of development of military, scientific and technological capacity should we follow the European model, at least in part the European model, of establishing separate institutes, or should we, as a country, endow to the universities the responsibility of the development of both the theory and the practice of science which is connected to the military? And Vannevar Bush, who was the science advisor, came to the conclusion that the cost and the effort to establish separate institutes would be too expensive. Some of the universities have the capacity both uh, in terms of uh, personnel as well as in terms of facilities to conduct the kind of work that was required. Now, you are sitting in an institution, I don't mean the USF, UCSF, but the University of California, which was one of the anointed institutions to conduct scientific research in that period. Princeton was another, Columbia was another, University of Illinois. And one of the aspects of that, and you, you should be aware of that, this is a land-grant university. 
under the Morrill Act of 18, not M-O-R-A-L, the M-O-R-R-E-L-L, the Morrill Act of 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill which said that if states would designate certain quantities of land for the purposes of establishing universities, the federal government would, on a more or less continuous basis, support that effort both in the construction of universities and in the construction of scientific and technological research. The first was they were agricultural and technical research, but of course that expanded to scientific research. So there was a predisposition, to use a familiar term, there was a predisposition of the federal government to utilize its own uh, law to establish the research university as a public university, with some exceptions, obviously. And, that, and Princeton, in that case, was an exception. Harvard was very reluctant, very reluctant. And of course, MIT later on became a very major place of scientific research. But when the war, and when the war ended in 1945, that did not signal the end of the federal government's involvement in military research, or military-related research. The National Defense Education Act, which was, which was enacted uh, shortly thereafter, did a number of very important things for this country as well as for the, um, for the Cold War. The first thing is that it, it, it really signaled the continuing commitment of the United States government to scientific and technological research and to supporting that research with considerable funds. Secondly, in order to maintain a high level of research capacity, it also provided under the National Defense Education Act billions of hundreds of millions and then billions of dollars later on for scholarships and awards and grants and student support for those who would go into areas of science and technology. So that this government, notwithstanding our cultural, I use the word our, not mine, but our, meaning politically, our cultural antipathy to public support for higher education. In the, because of the war effort, that is the war against the Soviet Union and China after 1949, uh, the Soviet Union at, at least uh, during the 40s and 50s, the United States government was willing to break with its tradition and provide support both for students and for universities that agreed and wanted to do military research. What the 38 to the 60s and 70s and 80s policies signaled was that the universities would in many ways become contractors for the federal government. Now the smart money in this federal government, including the Eisenhower administration, which was the administration of the 1950s, the smart money of the administration, I use the word smart money, I mean, this is a, a colloquialism to mean, you know, the, the leadership, uh, government leadership, understood that to a certain extent they had to support f fundamental, basic, pure, as it were, theoretical, scientific research. In order to assure that the applications, as well as the products, you know, there are three levels of scientific research, the applications and the products would be continually renewed and, uh, and developed. Then what begins to happen, of course, is that because the policy of the United States government was to contract out to private corporations, the three great generals of American society, General Motors, General Electric, and a military-based organization called General Dynamics, contract out to private corporations the production of goods, that is to say, of, of, of military goods of all kinds, up until and including space exploration and everything else. Um, 
because they had interest in private corporations, they established a precedent that private corporations could now become directly contractors of the federal government. That, that is to say, they did not exempt, except in the production of atomic bombs, that is, and finally of nuclear weapons, they did not exempt private corporations from becoming part of the defense effort, as in many other countries. So we had a private-public uh, complex of organization to, um, to foment the war effort. Of course, you know the story from here on in. What begins to happen in the 1970s and 60s and 70s is that there's an increasing importance of the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health to begin the process by which biological and medical science joins physical science in, in the production for the, of, um, of knowledge as well as in the production of goods. And pharmaceutical corporations and food corporations and, I mean, organiza and chemical corporations become part of the effort as well. So that what we begin to, so if anyone thinks, and I, I, would, I would be delighted to hear what you say, that science, not just technology, but that science in some way is opposed or, to, or independent of politics and policy, the history of the um, involvement, both from the 1860s, but primarily from the, Euro, from the Second World War on, uh, countervenes that idea. Science in the United States is inextricably linked to politics. The policies of federal government and, of large, and the priorities of large corporations become very important in determining one of the major elements of any scientific research, which is the choice of object, the choice of object, and the purposes for which that, ob that, that's, that research is ultimately being uh, made. Then there's a second landmark. And the second landmark takes place in the early 1980s when the Massachusetts Institute of Technology faculty is offered during a period when, because of an economic crisis of the early 1980s, which does not parallel this one precisely, because this one's much worse. We have, the good news is that we're going to have um, an economic crisis so that the rich, some of the rich are going to be brought down, and they're already being brought down. The bad news is that it's going to hurt scientific research. But it, the challenge of hurting scientific research in the early 1980s prompted the, the MIT faculty to make a formal agreement with a series of private pharmaceutical corporations and, and corporations that did, chemical corporations that did research, you know, Monsanto, Archer Daniels, Midland, you know who they are, did research uh, for, for, food, for food products. They made a deal in which they agreed to share patents in some cases and in other cases to accept funds for research in return for which they would give the patents to the private corporations that supplied the funds. That is not one of the greatest uh, public, uh, pieces of public knowledge, but it is a momentous and a historic agreement. However, the, in the midst of the debate, there were people who, rem uh, Noam Chomsky, who was a member of the, of the linguistics department of the Mass MIT, who voted for it, by the way, did not oppose it, reminded his colleagues, who were being very queasy about it, that they already had agreed to federal government intervention with respect to physics and to chemistry in relationship to, to the war effort on an ongoing basis, not just a hot war against Nazis and, um, and, uh, and, and Japan, but the Cold War against the Soviet Union, that this had become 
private policy. So he said, your queasiness about private, private um, cooperation and intervention is not well founded. They voted to uh, provide to the private corporations what they asked for, and the private corporations began to fund a great deal of, of research of, um, with, the, with the support of the federal government. Remember, this was the Reagan era, and Reagan was convinced that in any, in any activity, the private sector could do it better. Well, what that has meant for the last 70 years, it's now 70 years since the rearmament, 71 years, but particularly since the 1980s, is that the first element of the politics of science is that scientists do not decide themselves, especially in relation to the context within which their research is funded. They really don't decide themselves on the whole what they're going to study and for what purposes. And even if they decide to study things with their own purposes, which happens, they have a very good chance that the use of, those, of that research will be, com will be out of their control. Informally, during the uh, period when we were waiting for everybody to gather, I pointed out, and I will point it out to you now, that when the scientists who were recruited in the context of World War II to develop the atomic bomb, the nuclear weapons, saw the results of their research as it became, science became technology um, in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Nagasaki and the terrible human cost of that bombing. Albert Einstein, whose theoretical work arguably was fundamental to the uh, development of the atomic bomb, was horrified and organized a scientist committee to petition, I used lobby, to develop a public campaign for the banning of nuclear weapons. Einstein, Oppenheimer, Leo Szilard, some Brits like, uh, like Ernest Rutherford and so on, got together and did full page ads in the New York Times. Einstein himself, who was a very shy, not a shy man publicly, but shy personally, went on a tour and spoke to civic organizations and business leaders and labor unions and everybody else to try to get Americans to understand that nuclear weapons were dangerous, were a, a fundamental violation of human rights, and to abolish it. Now, what is important about that activity, which took place largely in the late 40s through the 1960s, was two things happened. The first thing that happened in the field of physics was that, in the physical science in relationship to the war effort, is that the candidate of the Democratic Party in the 1950s, whose name was Adlai Stevenson, partially agreed with the scientists and called for the abolition of nuclear weapons tests. And that sort of slowed down the movement. But the second thing that happened, which was very disappointing, not just to Einstein, but disappointing to Zillard. Zillard is spelled S-Z-I-L-A-R-D. Leo Zillard, he was a friend of Einstein. He was a major physicist, a major developer of, of, of uh, the atomic bomb. Was that the scientists themselves took the position that they could not refuse the support of the government to do the research that, even if not directly connected to the atomic bomb, could be developed as applications to the, to not only to military, to the atomic bomb, but to other weapons of mass destruction, to use a very favorite phrase. They themselves began to argue, as they did at the MIT case in 19, early 1980s, that we cannot, ref that if we are going to be scientists, we cannot refuse federal funds. 
we cannot refuse private corporate funds because that's because the federal government at a certain point simply does not provide enough of the funds to be able to support scientific research. It was, uh, it was terribly disappointing to the, to the physicists of that period. But I want to tell you that I have a very good friend, former president of the American Biophysical Society, who was involved in those early 80s debates. And when I came up to MIT after Science's Power came up to give a talk to biophysicists and biologists and chemists and physicists, an audience much larger than this, and argued with Jonathan, who was the pres had been the president of the Bio American Biophysical Society, that at some point, whether you take the funds or not, what should happen is that scientists should be part of the, a part of the effort both to, to inform citizens of the implications, the consequences of some scientific research, and to oppose its more horrendous applications. And this is 1990. They got up one at, one at a time and said, Mr. Ronowitz, that's all very interesting, but the federal government, but given the size of the, of the scientific enterprise, we cannot take the posi this position also because at that point, George Herbert Walker Bush and Reagan were in power. They were absolutely sure that, they, that their heads would be cut off. I don't mean that literally, but the money would dry up for anybody who took such positions. Now, Obama says science can move forward. I want to suggest, this is the first part of my talk, I want to suggest that what Bill Clinton, another president of the United States, said in 1993, is still the case, which is, I order, I urge the NSF and the NIH and other, other agencies responsible for science policy to reward dedicated research. The term he used was dedicated.